Okay, back to topic three. We were talking about microscopy, and uh, I'll come back to that Word document, those notes that we we're making here in a minute. Um, what I want to do first is talk about the labs, always talking about the labs. I um, want to talk a little bit about uh, answering questions. And I, um, I talked about this a little bit in the lab uh, and uh, just the idea of giving um, specific, complete sort of answers, right? So if you take a look, this is one of the questions you're responsible for in the assignment. And uh, you can see I even added this little extra comment here. It says, explain, referring to specific observations, trying to get people to be specific and not vague. So I'll give you two examples, right? Um, you can see both of them are answering at least the, um, the first part of the question in terms of which had the greatest or least number of bacteria. And, uh, uh, but you can see that the first one is, you know, like, well, what, you know, what does this mean, right? The most and the least. I mean, are we talking about one of them has five colonies, the other has four? Um, it's not very specific kind of language. Whereas the second one here, um, it's telling me not just the doorknob, but the doorknob of the chemistry lab and uh, exactly how many colonies were observed. And um, it's not answering the least part. That's probably going to be another sentence. So just kind of a rule of thumb. Uh, if you take a look, this is worth two marks. So two marks, I would say, is uh, two to four sentences. Kind of depends on how you decide to do your sentences and how long winded you are. You can go a little bit more. Um, it might be possible to do all the thing in one sentence, but that's kind of a ballpark there, right? So if you want full marks, uh, do make sure that you are thorough, complete, specific, those kind of things. If you ever have any uh, questions, you want to, you know, shoot me a sample um, of, of your work, I can always uh, give you feedback on that at any time. So in terms of the, uh, the lab report for uh, labs one and two, uh, this is a short report, meaning it's uh, worth uh, anywhere from about, uh, I think three to 4% of your, your final grades. So it's, uh, it's a smaller assignment. Um, if you take a look at pages 37 and 38 in the lab manual, there's actually two components to the first report. One is the actual short report and the other is the lab three pre-lab, which, uh, which is basically that library online assignment that we were talking about last, uh, last week. So make sure you complete these and uh, hand them in on Thursday. Uh, I think I have Moodle program to accept them uh, right till 11.59 p.m. After that, it's considered late. Um, if you need an extension of some sort, um, feel free to ask. The worst I can say is no. Remember, just, you know, be polite and ask me in advance and I'm more likely to, to grant extensions. Uh, you don't even have to give me the reason if it's something personal. I don't need to know that information. Uh, like I said, just being given courtesy and those kind of things goes a long way. So I want you to, um, uh, it's always good to have the name of the, the author in the title of the document. Uh, because, of course, you know, if something gets mixed up, I know whose it is and put your name in the document. That's always good. And I would like everything to be a Word document. Um, now, you may have some images, uh, such as the diagram that you're going to produce. You can insert that into the Word document, or you can, uh, you can submit that as a separate document. And that may not be a Word document, uh, probably a JPEG or something like that. And uh, you are uh, in, which question is it? Um, this question here, you are going to be submitting um, a journal article, and that journal article is going to um, be a PDF document, so you'll also be submitting a PDF document. So for most people, it'll be, you know, two documents, maybe some people will give me three, uh, and that's kind of what your, your first uh, report is going to look like. All right, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about for the first report. I'll come back to these at the beginning of class uh, once we get into lab three, because I have a lot to discuss around lab three, which is a formal report. And we'll, we'll get into that. There's uh, lots of time to, to talk about lab three, of course. Uh, oh, yes, here's just showing how you're gonna hand it in. Uh, go on to Moodle, click on this here. Usually I try to put the due date so that people uh, I can see that there, and uh, I guess I've given you that information already. 
So if you have any questions in terms of how to do that, uh, let me know. Obviously, you want to do, you know, try to get this done in advance. And I'm not going to be answering my emails at 11.59 on Thursday night. All right, so back to microscopy. Uh, last day, we were talking about light microscopy and fluorescence microscopy. And we started talking about electron microscopy and we talked about SEM. Remember, SEM stands for scanning electron microscopy and you're getting that uh, kind of surface 3D image. Um, the other main type of electron microscopy is called transmission electron microscopy. And in this case, the electrons are actually passing through the specimen. This actually destroys the specimen uh, with enough electrons, but uh, usually you can do it long enough in order to get a good image. Uh, you can see uh, the note here, it says that these are usually stained as well with a heavy metal. They're not using gold anymore. Tungsten or um, what's the other one? Osmium are, are pretty common uh, stains. Again, with uh, lots of electrons make the, uh, make the object a lot more visible. So in this case here, the electrons are penetrating the, uh, the specimen. And uh, so you can actually see a different type of detail. Uh, here's, another, here's another image of, uh, of an electron microscope. And uh, like I said before, this really here is the microscope and everything else is computers and, and other things like that. Uh, these tend to be a little bit bigger. Uh, they're a little bit more powerful in terms of the electron guns and you can actually get better magnification from them. So here's an image of uh, something I did. Uh, this was a lot of work. Uh, this was, believe it or not, about two weeks of work to get this image. And uh, I really wasn't very happy with it. So it was kind of the type of thing I decided I wasn't going to do that again. Um, it wasn't worth my time. But just want to show you the image. And you can see you're, you're, you're penetrating inside and you're seeing inside the cell. These are some bacteria, by the way. I'll show you some better pictures. Uh, here's one from the textbook. It's colorized. You can see they're looking inside of E. coli. And you can see the... Uh, the chromosomes are right here. You can almost make out a little bit of detail around the cell membrane. Probably if you zoom in some more, you can, you can make a lot of detail. Uh, here, in fact, is uh, uh, a membrane. In fact, this is two cells. And uh, I really like this picture because you can actually see that the membrane is a bilayer. You can see two layers in that membrane. And this is, uh, this is cell number two, also with two layers in this membrane. So really uh, amazing amount of detail. A lot of these black specks here are probably ribosomes and uh, large proteins. So making out quite a bit of detail with, um, with the transmission electron microscope. Here's another colorized one. You can see the endoplasmic reticulum. You can see mitochondria. Uh, the color makes the mitochondria pop out, those nice red things, and, uh, and all those ribosomes, of course. So very, very cool. Uh, again, we can look at, uh, we can look at viruses. Uh, here's our two pandemic viruses of the last 15 years, H1N1 uh, influenza virus and uh, the SARS coronavirus too. And uh, again, colorized to make them look pretty and nice. And you can just see the details popping out on these things. Here's just a comparison, right, between transmission electron microscopy, uh, looking at endoplasmic reticulum. So you can see uh, you're, you're just getting different details out of these things, right? And uh, sometimes scanning, you can get inside the cell. There's special techniques now to crack open cells. And I'm not really sure how they do that. I think they're actually very difficult techniques, but you know, you're, getting, you're getting different kinds of uh, information and details out of these things. So they all have their uses. All right, so just a comparison. Light microscopy, you can see E. coli. You can't really make out a lot of detail. Sometimes you can make out some detail like flagella and things like that, which we'll talk about. Scanning is getting the surface and transmission, you're getting the uh, inside and lots of details. I just wanted to show you uh, the largest scanning electron microscope in the world from Hitachi in Japan. Um, this thing is massive. What you're actually looking at here, this is a railing. So you could imagine you know, some little guy here standing there and, uh, and climbing it for, for some reason. Um, I'm not sure how much this is. Uh, you can call Hitachi for a quote. I'm sure it's quite pricey. There's a guy in there operating it and, and uh, I'm not even sure how many of these actually exist in the world, probably 10 or something like that uh, max, but uh, probably getting some pretty good images. I thought that was uh, kind of interesting to see. Uh, if you don't have millions of dollars, uh, I found this one on the internet for apparently $50,000. Uh, so, you know, 
just if you're interested in electron microscopy. Okay, so I just wanted to bring back the uh, the word document uh, that we were making. Uh, like I said, usually I'm, I'm doing this on the on the whiteboard and uh, kind of filling in the details as I'm talking. Uh, so I just wanted to put it up here for a moment to um, in case anybody missed anything. You can always review the uh, the lecture recordings if you if you do miss anything, of course. So this covers. Uh, we just finished talking about the transmission electron microscopy, and uh, you can see the difference in magnification here. You're up to about a million times. Uh, compared to SEM, which is only about uh, maybe 200,000 times. Uh, resolution, like I said, is about a nanometer. Uh, your typical membrane is maybe five nanometers or something like that. So making out some details on the membranes, not necessarily seeing the individual phospholipids or anything like that, but uh, getting a lot of good, uh, good information from uh, the electron mi microscope. There's just another image there comparing uh, the two. And... Uh, one thing that I really want to emphasize um, is, uh, and, and the reason why I emphasize this is because um, on our midterms, uh, sometimes I've asked the question to compare the two types of microscopy. It's a pretty common midterm question that I ask. Uh, and, and so you should be prepared to answer that. And I'll talk about midterms soon enough. We're, we're getting a little bit closer. Uh, I think we're still two and a half, three weeks away. Um, but when you're comparing light microscopy with electron microscopy. You should probably talk about light and you should probably talk about electrons. So just at a very basic, these are some things you should be including. In a light microscope, there's light, uh, and you can talk about the light sources such as uh, lasers or light bulbs or sunlight, and um, what is causing the magnification of the image, which is lenses. And again, you can talk about what those lenses are made of, you know, plastic or quartz or glass, Whereas an electron microscope, you have an electron beam, an electron beam is focused by magnetic fields. The very basic minimum, that's what you should be including in this kind of question. Uh, without that, uh, you know, I mean, it's right in the name, light electron. So, you know, that's exactly where you gotta start. So more on that or more on that uh, later. So I'm gonna switch gears and I wanna talk about something called uh, scanning probe microscopy. Uh, there is a whole bunch of different types that fall into this category now. It was invented, I think, in the 1980s. Uh, up until about 10 years ago, if you wanted one of these things, you had to build it yourself. So they weren't so common. Now you can actually buy commercial versions of these microscopes. And uh, they're a little bit different than uh, other types of microscopes. I wanted you to think about this kind of microscope as, uh, as kind of uh, how a blind person might uh, analyze an object. You know, we use it, use, we might look at, let's say you're looking at a, a banana. Um, you know, we're gonna look at it with our eyes and you can see that it's yellow and, and uh, it's sort of crescent shaped and maybe has some black spots on it and whatnot. Uh, whereas a blind person, they're gonna feel it with their fingers and they're gonna be like, okay, it's a little squishy. It's kind of long and crescent shaped. And so this is how the scanning probe microscopes work. Uh, you can see that diagram on the left, it's showing there's a probe. Um, which is that, uh, that pointy object here, so right there. And uh, it basically drags back and forth along the object and feels the contours. And those contours are gonna be put into a computer map and you're gonna get a three dimensional image. Uh, so the amazing thing with the scanning probe mic microscopy is we can actually now see individual atoms. Uh, this is incredible. Now, like I said, there's different types of these. They all have acronyms, scanning, tunneling microscopy is the one looking at metal surfaces. And uh, we can see, in this case, the gold surface on the left and the silicon surface on the right and, and make out uh, individual atoms. So really, really incredible. We can see very, very tiny, tiny things. Um, I wanted to show you this. Uh, IBM uh, has been a big researcher in, uh, in this type of microscopy. And if you take a look, uh, IBM discovered that you can, uh, in some cases, actually manipulate individual atoms and that you could, you could pick an atom up and you can place it. And so that's actually what they did there. They made their uh, corporate logo uh, with uh, individual atoms. I'm not sure what type of atom, but you can see IBM is, is spelt out right there. Uh, so, so pretty cool stuff uh, if you're into uh, advanced physics. I uh, want to show you this little video here. This is something that IBM did a little more recently. Uh, I'm just going to um, 
Yeah, I'm going to turn off the volume on this. I just just say a few things about it. So uh, they, it, rather than just doing their logo, uh, something a little newer, actually 2013 now, this is almost 10 years ago, uh, they decided, okay, let's let's go take this one step further and let's make a let's make a little movie uh, using this type of microscopy. And so here goes. You can see the little ball bouncing around, which is actually an atom. And uh, I'll let this play here for a moment. And they entitled it "A Boy and His Atom." So here it goes. So there's the atom, and there's the little boy on the right hand side, and He's playing with a little ball. And uh, anyway, I thought that was cute. I thought I would share it with you. I'm not going to play out the whole video, but just wanted to show you some of the capabilities of this type of uh, microscopy. And the image, by the way, is, uh, is done using the scanning probe microscopy. So one of the, um, the more common types of scanning probe microscopy is called atomic force microscopy, so AFM. And uh, here's one on the left. Apparently, it's the world's fastest. So I'm uh, uh, sure. <laughs> uh, maybe it's a slow process. I'm not entirely sure. But uh, you can see there's the, uh, the image on the right, and they've colorized the, uh, the image to show the different types of uh, different types of atom. The reason why I'm mentioning atomic force microscopy is this is the type that's almost universally used for biological specimens. And uh, I'll show you some biological specimens in a moment. Uh, here's something where they're looking at the the structure of a chemical compound. And again, really, really incredible to be able to do this kind of thing. So here's some biological specimens. Um, we can't get down to the atom level in biological specimens. The problem with biological specimens is they're, um, well, they're kind of squishy. And uh, you can imagine how that is gonna pose a problem as soon as you try to touch it, uh, you know, the, the shape is gonna change. So you can, you can still get down and get some interesting details. You can see on the left-hand side of some red blood cells, um, not the best image there, but you can definitely make up the basic shape. Uh, and you see a lot of studies like that. In that case, they were, they were measuring, um, oh, I'm just trying to remember what they're measuring with the red blood cells. I can't recall off the top of, of my head. And then on the right, you can see some interesting details of, of a platelet. And again, the colors are, are added later. Uh, we can see small things like viruses and bacteria. You can see there's a herpes simplex uh, virus on the left. And uh, these are individual capsid proteins on there. So this is really incredible. We can, we can make up some details on that particular virus. And E. coli on the right, and you can see it's looking a little warped. That's pretty common with atomic force microscopy because like I said, um, biological specimens are generally quite uh, squishy. There's some chromosomes, some uh, cancer tissue. Uh, here's another one of E. coli. I kind of like that one. Uh, I'm not sure it's why it's so bumpy like that. Uh, that might be an artifact of the, uh, the process. I'm not entirely sure. And oh, I guess I showed that one already. And uh, there's some more uh, viruses as well. I guess I was looking at different images and forgot to delete some of the extra slides. Uh, this is one of my favorites, which is DNA. So on the left-hand side is the uh, uh, kind of theoretical image uh, done from you know, a variety of different methods and the um, atomic force microscopy images is on the right. And you, you can see, um, you can see the, the helix in it. It's not the most amazing image, um, but you can see the helical structure of it. And you can see a lot of the noise just from dragging the, uh, the probe back and forth, but really incredible. I think it's, it's amazing you get a, a measurement of your DNA and everything from this. Uh, so pretty cool. You don't see this a, a ton in the, in the scientific literature yet, but it's getting to be uh, more and more common every year. So kind of going back to um, uh, sample midterm question um, about, uh, about microscopy. Uh, so usually in my midterms, I have, um, I'll have a couple of, uh, um, I don't know if you want to call them long or short answer type of questions. Uh, long answers, five marks. So it's not an essay. Five marks is, you know, it'd be five to 10 sentences, or in this case, you might want to do a table to answer your question. And uh, so five marks means you need to have five good points. So not like big and small, or this one uh, has better magnification. Give me some numbers. Uh, this one, you can see uh, it's asking you to compare and contrast those types of microscopy. So we made a table in class to do that kind of thing. Uh, you don't have to have all the details there. 
Uh, I'm looking for about five points. And, um, and then it's also asking for examples. So this is the kind of thing when you're giving examples of something you're looking at, don't just say a cell, right? I mean, that an egg is a cell. I don't need a microscope to see a cell. Um, so tell me what kind of cell and think about like what we did in the lab, right? In the lab, we were looking at plant cells or bacterial cells. Uh, you could talk about gram stains or looking at chloroplasts or whatnot. Uh, SEM and TEM, uh, you know, have, have special features regarding them. SEM, you're looking at the surface of something. So, you know, think about like we looked at the insect eyes in the, in the uh, examples I gave you on, on the, um, on the uh, slides here only the surface structures, TM, you know, you're zooming in and you're looking at organelles and things like that. So always be specific when you're answering these kind of questions. I'll be talking, uh, like I said, a lot more about the midterm as, as it gets closer. So part B of, uh, of topic three is just a few other things around um, uh, laboratory methods. Uh, one is about growing things in the lab, which you've seen a little bit around uh, growing bacteria using agar plates and, and uh, test tubes. So I just want to kind of talk about that a little bit and that's kind of going to wrap up the uh, wrap up the unit. So first it says here, uh, you know, why would we want to grow cells in a laboratory? So obviously the first thing is if you're doing a, a lab, so some sort of experiment or a learning uh, exercise, uh, that's important. Um, we do do this to diagnose diseases. For example, a few years ago, I had strep throat. And one of the things they did is they swabbed my throat and then they sent the little swab away for, um, for culturing, which is very similar to us, how we swabbed uh, around the lab or some people swab doorknobs and things like that. And it's uh, gonna be spread on agar plate and they're gonna look and, and, and diagnose it. Another reason is to produce things like vaccines. And then of course, there's many other products out there like a, a, a yogurt is basically a back to a culture. Um, we make wine, all sorts of pharmaceuticals. So, you know, there's lots of reasons to grow uh, cells. So just thinking about how we grow these things, you can think of this as sort of two categories. You can talk about physical requirements that includes things like uh, temperature and pH and whatnot and, uh, and chemical requirements. We'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, in terms of temperature, most things, kind of fit this category here, right? So you can see that it's about 15 to 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's kind of the optimal uh, temperature for most organisms on the planet. Uh, there's obviously lots of exceptions. There's some microorganisms that live in the soil and are perfectly fine uh, at cold temperatures. Um, and there's some that can live up to boiling temperatures and whatnot, but most, most things kind of fit into that category. And uh, a lot of organisms that we're growing in the lab their optimal temperature is 37 degrees. So 37 degrees is human body temperature. And uh, that's the optimal temperature for actually quite a few organisms on the planet or in near 37. Some are 35, some are 40, but 37 is good approximate. So the term we have for organisms that like normal temperatures is mesophiles. And uh, you can see there's terms for organisms that might like uh, warmer temperatures, such as thermophiles or hypothermophiles, which means they're liking really, really hot places. And, uh, and cooler organisms, psychotrophs or psychrophiles uh, are, are the names of them. Um, I have a list of some different uh, bacterial organisms here that are worth mentioning. Um, so we talked about Staphylococcus aureus, right? Remember that's a skin organism and it lives on humans. And so there should be no surprise that its optimal temperature is 37 degrees. Um, this, uh, the third organism there, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, causes tuberculosis. Also a human pathogen, also happiest at uh, 37 degrees. So I just want to point out two other organisms. E. coli, we're going to be talking about a little bit in this class, is um, its uh, optimal temperature is 40 degrees Celsius. So that's kind of interesting. But uh, you know, it turns out that E. coli doesn't just live in mammals, it actually lives in birds as well. And it turns out that birds' uh, body temperatures tend to be higher than mammals. And so 40 degrees actually does make a lot of sense. Uh, the last one I wanna point out, another human pathogen is Listeria. And it's happy at 30 degrees and actually also is happy uh, at fridge temperatures, so around four degrees Celsius. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is uh, is uh, every year you see in the news, there's all sorts of uh, recalls um, of food 
And one of the big reasons why we have food recalls is because of listeria. And so uh, here's, a, here's a product that was a recall, I guess it looks like a few years ago now, could probably dig up something newer. And uh, sometimes it's lunch meat, sometimes it's cantaloupes, and uh, it can be a pretty serious illness for people that are, um, you know, particularly for old people or young children or anyone immunocompromised, listeria can be quite serious. Ah, oh, there's the cantaloupe recall. Uh, this one was pretty serious. Uh, 25 people died from this outbreak uh, a few years ago now, it looks like. Ah, oh, here's some more uh, recalls of listeria. So I did dig up some new information. So some mini spicy cheese, cheese sausage. Um, if you're ever looking for food recalls, by the way, you can go to the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency and they have a whole web page talking about food recalls because usually the recalls aren't across Canada. Sometimes they're like, okay, you're looking for uh, sweet pea shoots that have been uh, delivered to Manitoba and Saskatchewan or something like that. So those are physical requirements. I'm not going to talk about osmotic pressure. That basically means how salty the environment is and pH. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, temperature is kind of a big one. Um, but the others are important. Uh, it's also important to have food for your organism and nutrients, and this includes a whole bunch of different things. So uh, again, I'm not going to break down these in a lot of, a lot of detail, um, but you need all of these elements for uh, building your macromolecules. Remember, uh, uh, carbon is found in, most of our, in all of our macromolecules. Nitrogen is found in proteins and nucleic acids. Sulfur is found in proteins. Phosphorus is found in nucleic acids and so on. And so all of these things are important. Uh, oxygen is another important thing, uh, depending on the type of organism you're going to be. Um, oxygen can be an essential nutrient or element, or it can be lethal. Uh, kind of depends on who you are. Um, some organisms, such as humans, are obligate aerobes. So obligate means you must have that thing, right? You're obligated to have something. So requiring oxygen for growth. And this, this includes um, a good majority of, of human pathogens and, and cell types that are grown in the labs. Some organisms are obligate anaerobes. So this means that they um, cannot tolerate oxygen and, uh, and are gonna be killed by it. And that, this includes some, some microorganisms and some pathogens as well. And some organisms fall into this category of facultative. And so what does that mean? It means that these organisms, uh, a lot of them prefer oxygen, but they're fine without it. And uh, this would include, for example, E. coli, which uh, prefers oxygen, but can live in your gut where the oxygen is, can be a scarce resource and does just fine down there. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we might grow some of these obligate anaerobes. Uh, we do have one organism in lab uh, five, four, five, four, in lab four that we're going to grow anaerobically. And uh, we do it in this, um, this system here called a gas pack. Um, it's uh, basically a big jar and you put your, um, you put your plates or your flask in the jar and you can, um, you can get these, uh, these gas packs, right? So this gas pack is right here. And uh, what it does is it, uh, is it eats up the oxygen and, and releases carbon dioxide. So it's kind of doing two things. It's expelling any existing gas or, um, or consuming oxygen. Another thing you can do is you can actually hook, hook a nitrogen tank up to this thing and flush out the oxygen. And that's uh, actually often what we do for, um, uh, for this particular or organism. Uh, you may have seen on movies, these glove boxes, which are a little bit more sophisticated and a lot more expensive, where the, uh, the organisms are put into a, a giant anaerobic chamber and you can, you can manipulate using all your tools, using these, uh, these gloves uh, that you're gonna stick through uh, to get at the, uh, the sample. So a little bit more on culturing. Uh, usually culturing looks something like this. You might have it in a test tube. We call this a liquid culture. And uh, you're gonna put a bunch of food in there. And there's a whole bunch of different recipes and often you can buy these, uh, um, uh, you can buy this food that uh, comes in a powdered form and uh, it's you know usually just add water kind of thing. Uh, here's one, a lot of them have interesting names like terrific broth, I kind of like this name. So that's why I'm showing you the recipe for that and what's in it. You can see it has some, uh, some tryptone and yeast extract. So this is a protein source. And the yeast extract is uh, just some yeast that have been 
digested enzymatically, and that releases all the things that are in the yeast cells, so nucleotides and, and other nutrients that are, are going to be useful for the, uh, for the organisms. And you can see we add up water and usually it gets sterilized before you put the, the organisms in there. So pretty common way to grow organisms. Uh, you probably know that, um, um, I was going to talk about agar plates, but one thing, the re reason why we're talking about bacteria a lot uh, is a fewfold. Uh, one is they're, they're very, very easy to manipulate in the lab and, uh, and, and they're cheap. We can't grow animal cells in the lab. Uh, we're talking about media costing $50,000 and things like that, whereas bacterial cells are very easy to grow, which is why we're, we're working with bacteria. Um, another thing about bacteria is they replicate very quickly. So if you take a look, this is showing some bacterial cells replicating. So they do it double at maybe 30 minutes, double again at 60 minutes, and then again at 90 minutes and, and so on. And so uh, what, what mean, this means is that you can get a lot of bacteria being produced basically overnight. If I were to grow uh, animal cells, we're looking at it taking weeks. And uh, when the semester is only weeks long, uh, you're not gonna be able to have those kind of cultures uh, in time. Uh, another thing that uh, we have seen in the lab are these agar plates. And the agar plates, of course, um, are solidified uh, or, or jellified, you know, whichever term you want to use. And, uh, and they're called an agar plate because they have agar in there. So what is agar? Agar is actually a carbohydrate from seaweed. And so there's the seaweed and the carbohydrate gets uh, extracted and it's also powdered form. And it's a lot like, um, it's a lot like making jello or jelly or jam or something like that. So you add the powder, you heat it up, and then you can see in this diagram, uh, somebody's pouring it into a Petri dish. And then uh, once it cools off, it solidifies and, and you get your agar plate. So agar plates are useful for seeing individual colonies. So that way, if you have mixed uh, species, you can make out uh, the differences between the different species. And uh, I was gonna show you another little video here. Uh, this was done on Google and they were doing it to uh, celebrate the birthday of Julius Petrie. Julius Petrie is the person who made, uh, invented the Petri dish. So this was quite a few years ago now. I'll just let this play for you and uh, you'll see what they're doing here in a moment. Uh, very similar what we did in the lab is they swabbed uh, a bunch of different objects. And of course it's Google, so they had to make their corporate logo. And uh, so there it is, spell out Google. They're going to show you what they swab. So an old sock. Um, what is that? A doorknob or a keyhole? Uh, a keyboard? A dog's mouth? A plant? And looks like a kitchen scrub brush. So anyway, cute little video. Thought I'd show you that as well. So uh, we've already seen our Petri dishes uh, and um, some people's were a little bit more interesting than others. And uh, you're going to get some different types of colonies. And uh, so in lab four, we're going to get a chance to uh, actually look at these under a microscope. We're going to do some gram stains and we're going to use some oil immersion microscopy. Uh, you can see in this one here, actually quite amazing how many different types of bacteria uh, they got from that particular um, uh, sample. And uh, we're going to uh, use some different terms to give them better descriptors, um, such as circular or filamentous. And, and uh, so you get a chance to uh, um, be a little bit more descriptive in, in, in uh, describing your, your colonies. Um, if, you, if you do this enough, uh, often you start to recognize uh, what you're seeing. Uh, so for example, you can see here's the difference between E. coli and bacillus. So look at that, E. coli is, uh, it's rounder, it's just shinier. Uh, the colonies are kind of like more raised, whereas the bacillus is kind of flat and, and, uh, and opaque. Even though they're the same color, you can see some huge differences. Uh, there's lots of interesting organisms out there. I don't know what half of these ones here are. I just pulled them off the internet to show you some interesting colonies. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we're not usually so lucky with what we see in the lab. Another one here, uh, sometimes you see differences in colors. Remember we talked about Staphylococcus aureus and aureus is the same meaning as AU, which is the periodic table element for gold. And you can see that golden color of the, uh, uh, of the uh, culture on that plate. 
or you can do art just for fun. Uh, it turns out there's a whole website devoted to microbial art. And uh, if you want to check it out, you can, you can go to this uh, particular website. So the other thing that we use uh, solid media for is streaking. Um, so a little word to the wise. Uh, if you go to Google and you are going to search something, just make sure you think about what you're searching. I was looking for an image to show streaking, but I was thinking in my brain, um, bacterial streaking. And of course the internet wants to show you what happens at a football game. Um, <laughs> so just a word to the wise on that. We, of course, were doing um, streaking for colony isolation. That was part of lab two. So just a quick review of how that works. Usually what you do is you, um, you smear or streak uh, a portion of a Petri dish with some culture. You sterilize your instrument and you bring that instrument through the initial streak and you spread it and dilute it. You do it again and again, put that in incubator. And if you're lucky, you're gonna end up with some individual colonies. And each of those colonies uh, in theory started off as one bacterial cell and it doubled and doubled and doubled again until you've produced yourself um, uh, a colony. And that colony, we can take it and analyze it and look at it under the microscope and so on. And so that's why we did this in lab two. And like I said, we're gonna analyze things in more detail in lab four. So what about culturing um, other types of cells? Uh, it's worth it to talk a little bit about culturing animal cells. Uh, I mentioned they're a lot more difficult to culture uh, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why. Uh, one is that the, uh, the nutrients are a lot more complex. Um, they require these special plates, uh, uh, surfaces to grow them on. So most of our cells in our body are attached to things like bones and ligaments and things like that. And so you have to often take these plates and they need to be coated with collagen and other things to represent uh, connective tissue in the human body, which, uh, which makes them a lot, uh, a lot more expensive as well. Uh, a lot of animal cells don't divide very well either. Uh, they take special ways to kind of encourage them to divide, which kind of makes sense. Um, if our cells divided like crazy, that's cancer, and uh, we don't want that to happen. So we want to have uh, really well-regulated cells. And, and then some don't even divide at all. Uh, once they're differentiated, that's kind of the end of the life for them. They, they live, and then they don't divide anymore. So a lot, lot more difficult to uh, culture animal cells. Uh, there's, there's a few exceptions out there, and this is kind of one of the, the modern foundations of, of modern uh, cell biology if you're looking at um, animal cells. Uh, and uh, one of the exceptions is studying um, cells that are cancerous. And so this was actually one of the very first um, usable animal cells to study were human cells. They're called HeLa cells. And uh, this is dating us way back to the 1950s. And uh, scientists were working at trying to culture animal cells. There were a lot of difficulties. And then uh, one doctor uh, was looking at uh, a patient. You can see her name there, it's Henrietta Lacks. And uh, it turned out her cells from her cervical cancer were growing actually very well. And uh, uh, these were shared amongst many scientists. And um, unfortunately, the way the, um, you know, the person coded his samples is he used the first two letters of the patient's first name and the first two letters of the patient's last name and they became known as HeLa cells. And uh, that's kind of a pretty big breach and kind of patient uh, client confidentiality. And of course, um, these cells became very famous. Uh, we got polio vaccine from it. We got, I mean, I don't even know, dozens of Nobel Prizes. And um, of course, it didn't take long for reporters to start saying, okay, where do these cells come from? And they went back to the family and the family was like, what are you talking about? Our mother's dead. And uh, anyway, it's, it's a very interesting human story. And if, if it's something you're interested in, I encourage you to check out this, uh, this book here. Uh, I think there's a movie on HBO with Oprah in it uh, as well, um, but a very good uh, nonfiction book. Uh, definitely worth a read if you're interested in cell biology. So what about viruses? How do we grow these things? Um, and why? Why would we want to do that? Well, again, scientific research and vaccine production. Uh, but the question is, how do we grow viruses? Uh, turns out, again, um, usually a lot more difficult. Uh, viruses don't eat food. Uh, you can't just give them some protein and some carbohydrates and, and let them go. Uh, they can only grow in cells. 
So therefore, that's how we culture them. We have to culture the cells first, and then we can grow the viruses in them. And I'll show you a few methods for culturing viruses. Uh, here's how we can grow bacteriophage. Remember, bacteriophage are viruses that infect uh, um, organisms such as E. coli. So you can grow a plate of E. coli. And so you can see this, is, this plate here is called a bacterial lawn, where you're smearing the bacteria over the entire plate. And um, the viruses, they kill the bacteria and they leave these little um, uh, gaps where there's no growth called plaques. And so you can stick your pipette right into that plaque and the plaque isn't gonna be rich in virus particles. So that's one way to do it. Um, animal viruses, uh, a little bit more complicated. If you're lucky, uh, you might be able to grow your animal virus in an embryonated egg. That's a fertilized egg. And uh, you can see this is actually done for quite a number of viruses that are used in, in various vaccines. So you can see influenza, mumps, and herpes are all, all in there. And uh, so eggs are pretty cheap and, and easy to, uh, to use. Um, also, all those ways I mentioned how we can do, um, uh, how we can do animal culture. So for example, using uh, transformed cells, meaning cells that are cancerous uh, is another way to do it. So kind of the bottom line is in order to grow viruses, you have to grow the cells first because, and if you can't grow, and in some cases we can't, there are some viruses we still don't have culture. So also relating to the lab, um, some semesters, by the way, I kind of get to this lecture before we start the labs. Uh, unfortunately, the way that the calendar has been working lately, I've been way ahead in the lab and in the lectures. So you can see I'm talking about some of the same things we talked about in the lab. Uh, aseptic technique, I'm not going to get into that anymore. I've already talked about it in the lab. Um, but the last thing I want to talk about, uh, something as well that we don't really get a chance to do because it kind of takes too much time, is something called cell fractionation. And this is another way to study cells and particularly their components and their organelles. And what you're trying to do with cell fractionation is A, break apart the cells and B, separate out the organelles. So I'll show you how this is done in the slides here. First step is you break apart cells. So you can do this mechanically. You can use a blender. Uh, there's other methods. You can use sonication, which is high frequency sound. You can use, use detergents, a um, whole bunch of different methods out there. And then you're gonna get this thing here called a homogenate. So homogenate is basically a mixture of what you just broke apart, right? Which is gonna include uh, all sorts of molecules, organelles, and so on. Then what you do is you put it in a high speed centrifuge. And so you can see um, this is showing a certain type of centrifuge called the swinging bucket centrifuge. And, uh, and then you spin it. And depending on how long and how fast you spin it, uh, you can start to separate out different components. So for example, uh, in this case here, uh, it's saying that for this protocol, you can spin at 1000 G for 10 minutes. So th this is actually something we could do with the centrifuges that we have. Um, of course, we'd have to stain the nuclei and all that. And we wouldn't be able to see a lot of details with the microscopes we have, unfortunately. Uh, you can spin it again. Uh, and now we're getting at speeds that are going to exceed our centrifuges. Um, 20,000 G for 20 minutes. Uh, that's, uh, that's pretty fast. And uh, you can start to get uh, smaller organelles, such as mitochondria and chloroplasts. Uh, you can start to spin at some pretty uh, crazy speeds. And, uh, and I've done this protocol before and, I, and the, you know, I don't necessarily agree with the 20 and 60 minute protocol. The protocol I had, by the way, took 16 hours of spinning. Um, so very different from what I'm, I'm seeing here. And I'm not really sure uh, which protocol they're, they're, they're showing on this uh, from the textbook. Um, and ribosomes 150,000 times G. Uh, that's so scary fast that uh, if the centrifuge breaks, it can, can literally explode in some cases, which is, which is very scary. Don't worry, they do, have, they do have safety devices on them. So uh, for cell fractionation, I kind of just want you to know that um, it's a, basically the definition. It means you're breaking apart cells and you're uh, isolating organelles by, uh, by centrifugation. Uh, I believe that is actually the end of today's topic. And uh, so that's it for topic three. Uh, I guess on Wednesday, we're gonna get into topic four, which is on membranes. And uh, that should spill over into Friday. And uh, just a small heads up, um, not sure yet uh, about Friday in terms of I may, uh, I may have to cancel class. Um, if I know in advance, uh, I might pre-record part of a lecture for you to view on Friday. 
but I will, I will let you know about that uh, probably on, uh, on Thursday. I'll let you know about that.